Uh, but uh, the story, and the reason a University of Hawaii professor uh, would teach it uh, is, uh, is he would use it as a, a logical argument, uh, not only to say that um, all religions are the same, but all religions are very mis misguided. And, uh, and of course, use it then to uh, tear down the faith of anyone that uh, might be in the class. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, I'm a Christian. I'll take religion 101. That sounds fascinating. But uh, uh, you'll, you'll be in for a real shock, of course, uh, in that class. The story goes like this, and then I'll show you the video clip. The story is of six blind men, and they come upon an elephant. And the, uh, the first one goes, and he feels the side of the elephant, and he says, oh, the elephant is like a wall. You know, he feels the broad side of it. Another one, his tail, he says, no, an elephant is like a rope. And another one, this tusk, no, the elephant is like a sword or a spear. And so these six guys all have a big argument afterwards because they know exactly what an elephant is like, and they all describe it. And the uh, little moral of the story is uh, they are all right, but they're also all wrong. And, uh, and in the case of uh, a, a philosophy or religion class, they would use that to say, and that is true of religion today. Uh, they all believe they have the truth, and they might be sincere in what they believe, but they're all misguided, and none of them has ever really seen God or known God, uh, and he is unknowable, even if he exists. Uh, and therefore, to adhere to some particular religion belief, you're like one of the blind men. You might know some element of the truth, but you really don't know what you're talking about. That's the way it normally goes down. And unbelievable to you as it may seem, I'm going to relate this to Christmas in a, in a minute. So let's take a look at the, uh, the video. Men of Hindustan, to learning much and climb, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall, against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl. God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp. To me it is mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up he spake. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, the chance to touch the ear, said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles the most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to croak, then seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, Koti, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. The each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. And they were all in the right, but they were all in the wrong. The poem uh, gets written by an English guy in the early 1800s, but uh, again, it's cited uh, in a lot of places around the world. And there's two, there's two uh, faulty uh, aspects of logic with, with this whole story. Uh, one is, is that uh, somebody's got to be able to see or nobody can tell the story. <laughs> somebody's got to be able to see what's going on uh, with the blind men who would be able to describe the elephant perf perfectly well. Uh, there's a fallacy in the logic. The second one is, uh, in terms of how it relates to Christmas, is that in this case, again, in these kinds of situations, the elephant is related to God, and uh, can we know God? And in this case, we'd say, yes, we can, because the elephant not only exists, but he speaks. The elephant can speak and describe exactly to the blind men who he is and help them sort out what aspect they've come to know. And that's what Christmas does. God speaks. Uh, God is born uh, in a manger. Uh, he lives a perfect, sinless life. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, I speak only the Father's words. I do the will of him who sent me. If we've seen Jesus, we know God. So the argument is faulty, and it's faulty because of Christmas, because Jesus did come, 
And certainly we had the, the law describing him and his characteristics and so forth in a way that we could know him before under Judaism, but not to be compared with Jesus. And as we think about Christmas, we often, rightly so, focus on the birth of Jesus. We then certainly want to think about the fact that uh, he was born for a reason, that he lived a perfect, sinless life, that he went to a Roman cross, that he died, and that he rose again. And that may be more relatable to our Easter message. But what I want to say is we kind of send our little invitation uh, out. We want to rethink Christmas a little bit. We want to think about not just the presence, but the gift. Often we say the gift rightly so, is Jesus. But what do we really mean by that? And ultimately, and again, our text this morning is going to be, we mean the grace of God. Uh, that's the real gift. Uh, there's a lot of people, and I've met, met them, you have too, that believe about Jesus, born of a virgin, uh, born in the manger. They believe that. Uh, they believe that he went to a Roman cross. They believe that he died and rose again, have never received the gift. The gift is grace. Uh, the gift is God's grace to us. That's the reason that, that he died. And that's Paul's point here as we look at Galatians uh, chapter 4. Here is the idea of a group of Christians that Paul has established a church with, ministered to, and they've forgotten Christmas in a sense, as we'll apply this text to our lives today. They've forgotten the ultimate gift, which is the, uh, the grace of God. He's going to make a little comparison. He's just used a, a figure of speech saying that we should, as believers, clothe ourselves uh, in Jesus Christ. And in that context, Roman world, first century, he means put on a Roman toga. Because as you do that, you're declared to be a, a, a grown-up son. You're an adult. You have rights. You have privileges and so forth. Because as a child, well, you don't have any of those things. That's his opening illustration here in verse 1. Where we would say in the past we were like children, but now Christmas has come. Paul writes, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. So that's his little opening illustration. We were like children, but Christmas has come. We can actually be like adults in terms of of a relationship with God. The New Living very simply puts that passage this way, where it says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, uh, even though they actually own everything their father had. They had to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age set uh, by their father, uh, and that's the way it is with us uh, before Christ came. We were like the children uh, but now Christ has come. Paul says three things in this analogy. In the past, we were like a slave. Again, the, the child, even though he is going to inherit everything from his father, <laughs> he doesn't get the inheritance until a certain age. He's still treated like a slave in a sense. He's ordered around the home. In a Roman context, you would have guardians and tutors and so forth. And sometimes we use that word tutor, and we think that's somebody that helps you uh, with your homework. Uh, you know, we've got the Kosasa Academy down here, and they've got full-time uh, students there, but they also have kids that come in and are tutored in the afternoon, maybe to help with a math or reading or help them prep for SATs or whatever it might be. Uh, but in the Roman world, a tutor, well, I've seen some pictures, some carved drawings of tutors in the first century. <laughs> a lot of them carried sticks. <laughs> and it sh they, were, they were responsible, like, <laughs> you know, you're going to get this if you don't get to school on time. They were the guardian. They would oversee every aspect of, of the life uh, of the child. Uh, and Paul is saying, until Christmas came, until Jesus came, until we came and were offered this tremendous uh, offering of his grace to us, we were like the kids in that sense under the law. Uh, we were just guardians. We can never enjoy the benefits uh, of a true relationship with God. Uh, again, uh, under the guardians, under the trustee, never experiencing the inheritance. Uh, also, he says, uh, this would end at a set time. A father could determine when the kids turn 16, when they turn 18. Some of you might have trust and you've determined, you know, who, when your kids are going to receive certain things at a certain age. You don't want to give them too much too soon. Even so in the, uh, in the Roman world, there's a set time when the child is now grown enough, in this case the son, 
he's able to put on a Roman toga, which means he's an adult, he's a citizen, he gets the inheritance, he has all the privileges uh, and all the rights uh, for, for doing that. Once, once that happens, he doesn't need to be under the tutorship of, uh, of guardians and so forth uh, any longer. Uh, he's beyond that. In terms of the Galatian and the church and the Jewish believers there, they no longer need to be under the law, under the Mosaic law. It's not about religiosity. Uh, now you're grown up. You're an adult. You can have a relationship with God uh, through the grace that he gives us uh, through Christ. And, uh, and that's an important, uh, important thing because sometimes even we, we lose, again, this meaning of what Christmas really should mean to our, uh, to our own lives. We don't need to falter and fall back uh, under the law uh, once again. We were, uh, Kathy and I, in the first service, we were sitting on the second row digging out our little iPhones to get pictures of our, of our granddaughter. She, she, was, she was up here. I know most of you were focused on her. No, we were. And... Uh, trying to get our pictures, and uh, just she's just getting her camera out, then Siri starts talking to us. And if you have an iPhone, you know what I mean. So Siri's the little voice that gives you uh, driving directions or tell you really important stuff like who won the World Series in 1986, certain thing, you know, you can ask her all kind of questions. And uh, uh, the trouble is we can't always get her to shut up. You know, and uh, I, we were, you know, visiting our son. We're on the golf course. You know, it's like somebody's hitting the ball. You want to be quiet. Siri starts talking in my pocket and telling me things. I think you need to recalculate and add new uh, information if you want me to get you to that. And it's like, how do I, how do I shut this thing up, you know? Uh, because once you have the directions and once you arrive, you don't need that voice <laughs> tell, telling you, enough, stop, stop already. We've, we've had the, we've, we have issues with our iPhones, what, what I'm saying here. But, uh, uh, you know, that's the way it is with the law. Once we're adults, uh, we don't need the law anymore. Uh, it's not a combination of both. Uh, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. In the past, we were like children, uh, but now uh, Christ, Christmas has come, uh, and we shouldn't live as though Christmas uh, never happened. Uh, again, we love the Psalms, and we love to read the Psalms and how they minister to us, uh, but sometimes we need to think about the Psalm themselves and the relationship the psalmist had with God. Uh, let me give an example, Psalm 119, 145. It's a beautiful passage, but notice how the psalmist is relating uh, to God. I, I cry out with my whole heart, hear me, O Lord. We, we say prayers like that ourselves, but notice, I keep your statutes. I cry out to you, save me, and I will keep your testimonies. I rise before the, uh, the dawn of the morning, and I cry for help. I hope in your word. We certainly hope in uh, God's word. We cry out to him. But it's not, it's not based on, I hope you're not praying those prayers. Lord, I really need your help now. And, uh, and I've been really good this week. And I've read my Bible this many times. And I've kept all the rules that I've established for myself. So based on my rule keeping and my religiosity and the fact that I haven't missed church in three months, now I pray, Lord, you'll grant this prayer. We may not say it, but somewhere in the back of our mind, we forget Christmas and that we're really grown uh, into a, adult status in terms of our relationship with God, and we can fall back into this religiosity uh, that uh, we're actually supposed to put behind us uh, and leave behind us. Uh, it's grace that we're under now. John begins his gospel that way in chapter 1 where he says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, again, different motivation. Uh, it's not just do the minimum. <laughs> it's not to figure out the essential commandments and try to, uh, and try to keep those. Uh, it's a different way of relating to God. Later in John's gospel in chapter 6, uh, some would-be, uh, wannabe disciples came to Jesus and asked him this question, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? In other words, what are the works? What are the many things we need to do to have a relationship with God. And Jesus answered, uh, this is the work, singular, that you believe in him whom he sent. My relationship now, our relationship now, is based on our faith in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not of yourselves. <laughs> it's the gift of God, not that of works, so that no one can boast. The gift Again, in a Greek text, singles it back, not to your faith, but to grace. God's grace is the gift. Uh, we respond by faith uh, in him. Uh, and it changes everything 
about our relationship with God. It changes the motivation for uh, what we might uh, do for the Lord and for the, uh, the kingdom of God. We had fun at the uh, youth group uh, Christmas party last night, and we got to hear uh, uh, meet a few new people and uh, hear uh, their testimonies and so forth, and that was that was fun and everything. I like uh, I like doing that, hearing that. I, I also like hearing how couples met and so forth. And uh, I uh, was reminded this week of uh, uh, Kathy's parents, uh, a classic classic story. So when they met, uh, they met at uh, Banana Stand, Kaneohe. Uh, when Kamehameha Highway was a dirt, dirt road uh, right down, down the middle. Uh, and Kathy's uh, grandfather was a farmer, and uh, they had all kind of banana and, and uh, uh, poi. Uh, uh, they grew taro. All the area kind of where our house is uh, by Pohala, you know, every, it floods out all the time. There's a reason. They say once it's a taro field, always a taro field. <laughs> so they're, they're over there installing right now a bunch of... Uh, uh, a bunch of uh, Stuff to try to help with the, with the drainage at the golf course over there. But uh, uh, they had the banana stand in Kaneohe and, uh, uh, in, on Cam Highway. So Lorraine would be in there uh, at the banana stand like all the kids had to do, especially the daughters. And uh, it was happened to be adjacent to the home that uh, Hugh was living in. So Hugh had done uh, four and a half years, uh, World War II with the Army Air Corps. He had uh, come back. That's a long deployment, isn't it? Four and a half years? That's a pretty long deployment. And he had come come back, and uh, his father wanted him to rake, rake the leaves in the yard uh, when he got back. So, you know, he's an obedient son, so he went out to rake those uh, leaves, and then he happened to notice this very cute young Okinawan girl just right there, right there in the banana stand. So uh, he raked those leaves every day. In fact, he raked his leaves to where there was no grass left. It was pretty much just dirt. Uh, uh, and it wasn't because his father said, you must rake, rake the, uh, the leaves in the yard. It's a different motivation. Was he doing what his father wanted him to do? Absolutely. Uh, but not for the reasons because the law said. No, it was a different motivation. That's grace. When we understand that God forgives us in this way, that he gives us his mercy, he gives us his unmerited favor that we don't deserve, it changes our relationship. Uh, we become adult sons. We put on the toga. Everything is different. We're now heirs of everything that the Father uh, has for us. And Paul is reminding the church in Galatia uh, and us as well. In the past, we were like children, uh, but now Christmas has come. Secondly, at the perfect time that first Christmas came, he mentions that in verses 4 to 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. It was the perfect timing. Uh, The word timing doesn't mean like, like it was a really good time like the weather wasn't harsh or something. Uh, It means chronological time. In the chronological time of all history, God shows the exact perfect time uh, for Jesus Christ to be be born. Uh, And in in one way, uh, it's because of prophecy. Over in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel the prophet, he's living in, the, uh, in ancient Persia, he's living in Babylon, God is speaking to him uh, and allowing him to see what would happen in the future and speak about things that would happen in the future uh, so that the people would be encouraged, so that people like us would know the accuracy for the inspiration of the word of God itself. Uh, and he talks about this perfect timing uh, of the Messiah coming in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. He says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. Uh, The word sevens there in the plural is the Hebrew word shabuah. It's like our word decade. When we say it's been two decades, we mean two times ten, that's twenty years. Uh, The word shabuah, the sevens here, is seven years. So what Daniel is saying is that uh, when there are seven sevens, or 49 years, and 62 sevens, 434 years, if you put those together, 483 years, aren't you glad you didn't have to figure that out yourself? Uh, if you put it in a Babylonian calendar, 360 days a year, then you get 173,880 days. He is saying, you're thinking, oh, no, I should have gone to Starbucks on the way here. Uh, he's, he's saying that 
uh, from the time there's a decree issued. We're all living here in, in Babylon, in ancient Persia, but whenever, whenever this guy lets us go back and he issues the decree to allow us to go back and restore and rebuild Jerusalem with a wall and with a trench, he's very specific. From the, fourth, from the issuing of that command, you can start a clock 173,880 days later, the Messiah will come. What happened on that day and what are the dates? Well, based on, a, uh, we know that it took place, that command by uh, Longomanius Artaxerxes. He ascends to the throne 465 B.C. In the 20th year of his reign, which would make it 445 B.C., in the Jewish month of Nisan, I know you thought that was a car, uh, on the 14th uh, of uh, our calendar would be March, 445 B.C., the command is given. Count off the 173,880 days, and it takes you to April 6, 32 A.D. What happens on that day? On that day, Jesus stands at the top of the hill, the Mount of Olives. He sits on the, bound, uh, uh, the back of a donkey. As Zechariah 9.9 prophesied, when the Messiah comes, he will come lowly and riding on a donkey. And the people greet him as he comes down into the city. They wave palm branches to him. They lay their cloaks on the ground. And they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the Lord. It was Jewish for meaning, you're the man. <laughs> you're the Messiah. And Jesus saying, yes, I am. That all happens on the exact day that Daniel said that it would. So Paul says, God in the perfect chronological time sent the Messiah. That's one aspect of it. There's another aspect uh, that uh, is in terms of language itself, because a guy named Alexander got the idea that he would conquer the world, did a pretty good job of it, uh, conquered a, a great portion of it, uh, and spread his Greek culture uh, throughout the Middle East and Southern Europe and so forth. Uh, that uh, a lot of officials begin speaking the Greek language. The Romans come on his heels and they say, you know, this would be very helpful if everybody spoke the same language. Uh, I think we could communicate a lot better. Uh, and so the institute uh, for the Roman Empire, uh, the Greek language. That would make it a little more helpful if you were a missionary in the first century and you needed to uh, uh, you know, hop on down the road somewhere to another place to share the gospel. It's a lot more helpful uh, if you can speak the language. I can tell you because <laughs> uh, I go to China and I don't speak the language. And it's, uh, uh, it's tough just to order rice in a restaurant, I can tell you. Uh, I can tell them if it's good after I'm done eating, but that's all I can tell. I can tell them, don't put ice in my drink, but I'm very limited. But uh, uh, these missionaries in the first century, it was the perfect time for Jesus to come to be born because of prophecy, but also because of the Greek culture. What Alexander did, what the Romans did, there was one common language, and it was the Greek, Greek language. And we are very thankful the New Testament is written in Greek because it is a highly complex language. Therefore, we know exactly what their intent and the meaning uh, of every word and phrase that are, we have in the New Testament. Uh, the other spac aspect of this perfect timing was, uh, was roads. We, we take a lot for granted. We complain about the potholes we have here uh, in Hawaii. But I can tell you, there's a lot of places around the world. Our roads are, would be envious to them. One of our uh, missionaries who served for a number of years in Cambodia came back uh, to Hawaii for some R&R, &R, and she brought one of the Cambodian gals with her uh, that she had, uh, was ministering to down there and stuff. Uh, and when she uh, got here, this uh, Cambodian gal, she was really impressed with Hawaii. One thing in particular, and it wasn't the weather, it wasn't the environment, it wasn't the surf, it wasn't the beach, it wasn't the mountains. It was our roads. She couldn't get up. She kept saying, that, you have wonderful roads here, you know, and uh, <laughs> because, yeah, compared to a dirt road full of charcoal and mud and so forth, uh, we have awesome roads. Here's a picture of a, of a Roman road. Uh, not bad. Not bad for the first century. Uh, there was a road that went from Constantinople like that to Rome, a thousand miles. And these roads went from southern Europe all the way through to the Middle East. It was easier to get around. And because of what's called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, of course they had peace because they bludgeoned everybody uh, into submission and so forth, but it meant that you could get on that interstate freeway in your little wooden cart or your two feet or your uh, donkey or whatever you got, uh, and head on down the road, and you didn't need uh, uh, lots of men with weapons with you, because you did. You do in some parts of the world. 
uh, today. You did in that part of the world, but not under the Roman rule. You could pretty much safely travel on a road like that for a thousand miles. Uh, all of these things meant it was the perfect time. In the perfect time, God sent his son. Perfect in terms of prophecy, uh, language, uh, and certainly roads, and we could go on and on. Even secular historians were writing that in the first century, there was a great expectation that, that somehow a deliverer was coming to the world. Very, very secular guys were even uh, uh, talking about this uh, time period. It was the perfect time. In the past, we were like children, but at the perfect time, well, that first Christmas came. Thirdly, at the first Christmas, uh, their birth was phenomenal, and that's in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. So the son is miraculously born of a woman. Notice first that it's God sending his son, sending his son that already exists, sending his son that already exists in heaven, sending him to, uh, uh, to earth. Secondly, he's not born of a woman in the natural sense. Paul uses a different Greek word. It literally says that he became of a woman. He doesn't even use the term birth. We just translate it so we can kind of read it into English a little easier. Dr. Luke records uh, that whole passage uh, this way. In case you came hoping that, I hope they're going to read the Christmas story at some point in time. This is it. Uh, chapter 1 of uh, Luke's Gospel, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called uh, the Son of God. So there, there's the, you know, Mary's uh, perspective of the birth announcement of Jesus coming. Uh, she responds with a question. Uh, we'd say it's not a question of unbelief. Uh, but it's uh, a question that uh, uh, I could use a little more information <laughs> here in terms of how this is really going to work out uh, because I'm a virgin. I've never, I've never known a man. Uh, again, uh, Gabriel's expression is, or his explanation is, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He will overshadow you is uh, one of the translation. The Greek word is episkiazo. Uh, it's the same word that's used over in Matthew 17.5 where Peter, James, and John go up with Jesus and what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. There it says, while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed. That's our same word, them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Uh, to overshadow, to envelop God's glory coming upon. It's an Old Testament picture. It's one that Mary would have understood. The children of Israel, as they leave uh, leave uh, uh, Egypt in what we call the wilderness wandering. God led them by his presence, physical presence, pillar of fire at night. Very handy if you don't have a flashlight. Uh, and then, of course, a, a cloud by the day. God's visible presence that remained over the tabernacle where Moses would, uh, would meet with God. It's a figure, it's a word that they would be familiar with. Uh, and Mary understands this is going to be supernatural. God's presence will come upon me and will enable me by a miraculous means uh, to conceive a son. Uh, and it's for the purpose, of course, of redemption, redeeming his people, uh, Israel. Verse 5, Paul mentions this idea of redeem, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption uh, as sons. Uh, that word is a word that's used to purchase a slave. That's going on today. There are people that are able to get into northern Iraq and buy people back from ISIS, uh, Christians that have been captured to try to save their lives. It's 
been done for a number of years in the Sudan because, again, the Muslim population in the north attacking those in the south, uh, killing the men, taking the women and children as slaves. Uh, there are Christians that go over at times in the past have tried to purchase them uh, out of slavery. That's our word here. It's a word that is still uh, being used in the, in the world today because of situations like that. We were slaves to sin. Uh, our destiny was hell, but God redeemed us. He bought us back through the blood uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the past, we were like children, and sometimes we forget the real meaning of Christmas. It's not just that Jesus was born. It's not just that he lived a perfect, sinless life. It's not enough that he died on a cross or even that he rose again from the dead. Many people leave that, and they've never received the gift of Christmas, which is the grace of God, which redeems us. Uh, back from a life of sin, forgives us, and it, it rescues us uh, from a destiny in hell, uh, rather to be with him for all eternity. Uh, our Redeemer makes us his sons uh, and his daughters. Uh, the results of this uh, is his presence in our own hearts. Look at verse 6. Uh, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son uh, into our hearts. The result is uh, we call him Abba, or Abba Father, which is, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, just a staggering thing to think about uh, uh, the Jews that worship God in the Old Testament, uh, they would never even say his name. That's why when they would write it, they would never put a vowel. They would just write, well, transliterated into English, Y-H-W-H. We, we throw a couple of vowels in there and say it was probably uh, Yahweh, or it was Yehovah, uh, or whatever. Uh, his name was so holy, uh, and now Paul says, you know, this is a, this is a game changer here. Uh, not only are you adult sons by his grace with all the rights and privileges to be able to come before him uh, and uh, an heir with him, uh, but you can now call him uh, Abba Father. The last time we were uh, in Israel, and uh, we were uh, in Jerusalem in the old city, and, and uh, we were walking along, and I noticed uh, a young dad with about a three, three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old son with him, uh, they were walking along, literally the cobblestone streets, and I, I, uh, I began to stalk them. And, uh, and it was for the purpose <laughs> of this passage. I wanted to hear this kid say it, you know, say these words. And uh, so I, I kind of just walked a little closer to them, and uh, it didn't take long till the, like most uh, little guys, he starts, you know, pulling on his daddy's arm, and he's trying to get him to stop, you know, because he sees something, and he's saying those words. He's saying, Abba, 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 Daddy, Daddy. I, I want your attention. That's what Paul says that we, uh, we can say to God. Our relation is so different because of grace. He mentions it to the church in Rome as well in Romans 8, 14. For as many are, are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Before that first Christmas, people lived under the law. Uh, people didn't have uh, that kind of relationship. Uh, and no one could perfectly keep the law. And everybody kind of lived under a condemnation most, most of the time uh, in their lives, even if, with their best efforts. Uh, but Paul says here in verses 8 to 11, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't turn back to a previous time uh, before Christmas came. He says, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you uh, in vain. Paul says in a previous time, we're in submission to those that are well, they're by nature, they're not really gods at all. And, uh, of course, there's places around the world, including here in Hawaii, where people still uh, worship uh, images, images made by the hands of men uh, based on a mythology and so forth. Uh, and they're, Paul says they're not really, uh, really gods at all. Uh, but God did kind of wire us for worship, for worshiping someone or something. It's, uh, it's our natural inclination. Uh, that, like that great prophet of old, Bob Dylan once said, you've got to serve somebody. Some people are going, I've got to look up there. Who's, who is that? Uh, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil. It may be the Lord, but you've got to uh, serve somebody. 
Uh, it's intrinsic in, uh, in all of us. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and one day, in one day, maybe within a year, maybe within two years, the University of Hawaii will have a good football team again. I'm just, <laughs> I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet, but I'm just saying, eventually, uh, and when that happens, uh, you'll be able to go out to Aloha Stadium on a Saturday night and see 50,000 people worship. I mean, they get excited. They get pumped at those football games. They scream because they want to get behind something. They want to do something. They want to root something on. It's just kind of an intrinsic. Is that really worship? <laughs> for some of them, it is. <laughs> it's their life. <laughs> and, uh, it's what they live for. Uh, but uh, it's built in us. 95% of the people groups around the world, before a religious person shows up, all have one thing in common. They all believe that there's one God and one true God only, and that he is the creator. Uh, they believe that something happened in our relationship. They might describe it as sin, a breaking, a falling away, but something has been torn, something has severed the relationship with that one true God who is the creator. 95% of people on the planet had this basic belief system before religious people show up. They also believe, uh, again, in an Adam and Eve type story, and most of them have a Noah type story, God wanting to uh, bring his judgment uh, in order to redeem a family uh, that he might try again uh, in terms of uh, having uh, a group of people on the planet that would know him and love him and so forth. 95% of the people uh, around the planet and their basic tenets of their faith hold that view to be true. And, uh, and there's still, uh, 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 you can still see it in some cultures uh, around the world today. When, we, uh, when we're in China, if we go to Beijing, you know, we kind of uh, take uh, uh, Bibles and materials to the house church there, of course, and uh, we're there as a group of people, so we kind of do tourist stuff. And one of the things I like to do is go to a place in Beijing called the Temple of Heaven. And the Temple of Heaven was built by uh, one of the great emperors of China. Uh, and he built the Temple of Heaven because he believed, as all Chinese did for 2,000 years, uh, and that there was uh, one true God. Uh, and so he builds the temple to the one true God who is the creator God. Uh, and on one day uh, of the year then, uh, he would go to that temple uh, he would sacrifice an oxen. He would take the blood and pour it out, believing that on that day he would attempt to be not only king but priest also and intervene. And he would pray to the one true God uh, that that, sin would, that uh, blood would somehow atone not only for his sins but for the sins of the people. Pretty interesting place. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Uh, people have this intrinsic need to worship in them. And Paul says that the problem is you worship gods that are not gods at all. And that all changed when Christmas came. That all changed when Jesus was, uh, was born. Uh, the tendency to worship, uh, but often we don't know what we're worshiping. We're worshiping things that are not gods at all. But Paul says, but that's changed. At a point in time, we came to know God. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, through Jesus Christ, this whole new relationship comes into uh, being. So he then says, so stop acting like Christmas never came. D don't go back into a religious road. Don't go back thinking it's your duty, uh, it's your responsibility. It's the stuff that you do that helps you have a relationship with God. No, Jesus has already purchased it. Jesus' death on the cross, his blood poured for us, out for us, it's sufficient for all of our sins. All of our sins, past, present, and uh, in future. Uh, we are not saved, Paul says, by the righteous things we've done, but we are saved by his uh, mercy. And Christmas should always be a reminder, not just of a baby born in Bethlehem, although that's awesome, and not even of just the perfect sinless life that Jesus lived, not even just his death on a Roman cross, and not even just his resurrection from the dead, but it should remind us of the grace of God. That's the gift. Uh, that's what's made possible by Jesus' death on the cross. He says, if you'll look to me, if you'll place your faith in me, I will forgive you of all of your sins. Paul says in Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10, uh, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, uh, you'll be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with the mouth that you confess and are saved. It's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple deal. 
just want to close this one uh, illustration. I, I'd heard this before, and I finally read it, uh, read it in a book this week, and I'll, I'll, uh, always good to have uh, a, a point of reference for, uh, for stories to know they're not just made up. Uh, but it has to do with search and rescue. And uh, ever since uh, our son Josh had to do uh, Siri for his uh, pilot train and everything, and we learned all about that and so forth, you kind of get interested. Plus all the shows, you know, got Survivor Man, Survivor Man, all these shows. It's kind of interesting. But uh, uh, the people that uh, uh, go out and search for the people that get lost uh, in the wilderness, uh, all basically will say the same thing, uh, that uh, the people that are the most likely to be found when they're lost in the wilderness have one thing in common, their children. <laughs> the children are a lot easier to find. And the reason for that, they explain, is that uh, when a child is out there in the woods or somewhere, and all of a sudden they realize there's no adults around, they, 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 they're like, ah! They, they, don't, they don't move. They sit right down. Uh, uh, they, they don't go anywhere. Uh, they stay put. They're waiting for an adult. They know they're lost. They are very <laughs> quick. There's no adults around. I'm lost. You know, I'm screaming. I'm lost. And they just kind of put themselves right there on the ground. Uh, if it gets cold, they get some leaves or whatever, throw it around them, try to make a little shelter and keep warm. And, uh, and then when they go to look for it, where was the last place you saw them? Well, it was, it was about here, about a mile north of this road. Well, let's start our search there. And Brad's, oh, they find the kid a half a mile away from the last time someone saw him. Unlike an adult. It's because the adult is different, especially if you're a guy. Uh, you're on the, in the woods, like, eh, it's not really looking familiar here. I'm going to pick up my pace a little, you know. That's smart, right? You're lost. Let's go faster, you know. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, mile, two miles later, no, not looking familiar. Keep going till sundown, you know. And it's like, okay. So by the time they, they go to look for the guy, you know, the next day, if they find him, he's 12 miles away from uh, the, the uh, epicenter of where they, uh, they began to look. Uh, and uh, a gal named Rebecca Solnit wrote a book called A Field Guide to Getting Lost. She's part of rescue teams in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and it's very, very interesting. She said, uh, unlike many adults who get lost in the Rockies, uh, kids don't desperately try to save themselves. Kids don't try to save themselves. That's why they get saved. Uh, and uh, I would say that the same is true of us. You're not going to do well in that category of trying to save yourself from your sins and having a relationship with God. Don't try to save yourselves. God has already done it through Christmas. God has already done it through sending Jesus Christ. He's already done it. Uh, we're not the blind men trying to figure out religion. Uh, I have a part of the truth, but I don't have all of the truth. No, the elephant spoke and uh, uh, described God to us. Uh, we have his word. We know exactly what God is like. He just, again, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only come to do the will of my Father who sent me. We know exactly what God is like because he revealed himself to us because he left heaven and he came to earth and he was born as a babe in the manger, but he lived that perfect sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the dead, not so that we could have a a better religion than the other guys or a better elephant so that we can have a relationship with him that we could never attain ourselves all by his grace, saved by his grace, not what we deserve, but rather his favor that he gives to us. So I would say don't reject Christmas because <laughs> a lot of people do. Isn't that interesting? They celebrate it, but they reject the gift of Christmas, which we say certainly is Jesus Christ, but ultimately it's his grace. It's not enough to believe what Jesus did. You actually have to receive that gift for yourself personally. But what if, what if my mother did or my father? You know, my grandfather was a pastor. It doesn't help you. You <laughs> say there's no, no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There's only children. Uh, and, uh, and for us, it's an individual decision we all have to make at a point in time. We simply say or pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I place my faith in what you've done for me on the cross, that it was the sufficient payment for all of my sins. The writer of Hebrews says, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Uh, Jesus is interceding for us uh, all the time. Uh, he lives, therefore he is able to save us completely. 
Uh, we don't have to live a life like children. We don't have to live a life serving gods that are not really gods at all. Uh, we can know the one true God and have a relationship with him. That's Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that uh, we've come to know your grace and your mercy. And even those of us that have come to know you in that way, we've placed our faith in you. We've said a simple prayer. You've given us your spirit. We have a relationship by which we can, well, we can address you as uh, Abba Father if, if we choose to. Uh, even, even we, in time, can start thinking it's all about us and our efforts and what we do and then we're not able to do and then we're kind of condemned and, and we just kind of lose, lose our way. And unlike children, we kind of move faster and get more lost. And it might be a great time for us to just remember your grace uh, this morning to uh, celebrate Christmas by celebrating your grace given to us. Lord, and if there's uh, anyone else here that maybe uh, well, they just kind of got it figured out that they will never be good enough and uh, can never do enough religious stuff. Uh, but they want to know you and have a relationship with you and to know that they're going to heaven for all eternity. Uh, and if uh, you, you're in that category, you just need to say a simple prayer like this and say, Father, I, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and I place my faith in Jesus Christ who died for me personally on the cross. And I believe he rose again. And because he did, I know that my sins uh, can be forgiven. Uh, and I ask you to write my name in your book of life so I would be assured of being in heaven for all eternity. That is the greatest gift. Uh, I pray to receive it now in Jesus' name. Uh, it's just a prayer like that. Uh, and if you've never done that before, I would just want to give you the opportunity uh, to acknowledge that before the Lord. Uh, in a very simple way, simply by raising your hand uh, very quickly. I'll just acknowledge that with you, uh, and I'll be happy to pray with you and, uh, and pray for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, as far as I know, everybody here knows the Lord, and that's, uh, that's awesome. But just to uh, give the opportunity uh, that if God is speaking to your heart uh, and tugging at your heart, uh, you should respond because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. What does that mean? It means you might not get another shot. You might not sit in an environment like this again. Uh, you may not hear these words in the, in the same way again. Uh, so we just give you that moment uh, and, uh, and really desire uh, you to receive the, the greatest Christmas gift there is in terms of eternal life. So let's pray. Lord, we do pray for uh, anyone here, Lord, that's uh, hearing your voice. You're speaking to their, their hearts. Just draw them to yourself by your love uh, and your grace. What a joyous thing it is. Lord, to know you, to be able to sing to you and to uh, worship you. Uh, uh, we love football, but it may not, it's not anything like it is to, to rejoice over you and our salvation and who Christ is to us, Lord. So uh, make us true worshipers of you, those that really worship you in spirit and truth. It would just be a, a reality to our lives. It would be evident to those around us. Uh, and especially this time uh, of the year, Lord, may we celebrate you uh, and may your love overflow from us to all those around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.